Socialist Art and Historical Society. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Dr. Sharika Crawford's talk on her newly published book, The Last Turtleman of the Caribbean. So during the talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the text box and at the end, we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Uh, we'll also be giving away uh, six copies of her new book. Everyone who attends this evening will be entered into that drawing and winners will be notified tomorrow morning by email. Uh, we also have a donate button at the top of the screen. Uh, if you can, please consider please making consider um, anything helps and it'll allow us to continue to offer these lectures for free. Um, so with that said, Dr. Crawford is the Associate Professor of History at the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. Her scholarship focuses on Latin America, the Circum-Caribbean, and West African nation of Ghana. Recently, her book, The Last Turtleman of the Caribbean, Labor, Conservation, and Boundary Making was published by University of North Carolina Press. Welcome, Dr. Crawford. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask the audience just for one moment to bear with me as I uh, learn my newly uh, skilled transitioning of uh, screen sharing um, to start my talk. Hopefully everyone sees the title page. Okay. I want to take a moment to thank the institutions that financially uh, supported the research that produced my book, The Last Turtleman of the Caribbean. Um, I've listed them here. I also like to thank Corey Convertito and Cassandra Collette at Key West Art and Historical Society for inviting me to speak today and for facilitating um, the logistical preparations um, for today's event. Um, there was some behind the scenes uh, maneuvering between Cassandra and I um, to prepare for today. Um, I also recognize the financial sponsors who have made um, this distinguished lecture series possible. And finally, to those of you, the audience, um, listening in on this virtual lecture this afternoon. Thank you um, for coming. When most people hear of places like the Key West or the Cayman Islands, they likely imagine crystal clear turquoise waters perched along white sandy beaches for miles and miles. In fact, many people visit these places because they offer a tropical respite from their ordinary lives and reflect a sense of relaxation and peace. If they manage to pull themselves away from the water and beach, some might venture into town to learn a bit about the history and the culture of these places. And what would they learn? Well, both places are situated and are part of a wider Caribbean. Both places are known for maritime activities of the past and present. While Key West unabashedly is known as a conch republic, it was also one of several places in the greater Caribbean um, connected by another maritime activity, the harvesting and consumption of sea turtles. A turtle industry probably sounds a bit odd, mostly because we've forgotten how important it was to the local consumption and economies of many small islands in and coastal communities around the Caribbean Sea. In fact, it's a part of the Caribbean history overshadowed by other narratives of the region. The watery spaces of the Caribbean are unfamiliar to most people acquainted with the region's past. Um, the use of enslaved Africans and their work on plantations continues to dominate historical thinking on the economic, political, and social organization of the Caribbean for much of its modern history. Places like Key West or the Cayman Islands, the home of the turtlemen in my book, existed under different sets of, set of conditions. Due to the small size of the Cayman Islands and the history of European settlement there, Many historians saw it as a minor and insignificant British colony. Yet these islands and others like them have much to teach us about the full breadth of lived experiences of people making their homes in the islands and coastal communities around and in the Caribbean Sea. In addition to slavery and the agro-export economy, historians have also paid strong attention to piracy and revolutions like in Haiti in the late 18th century and Cuba in the mid 20th century. Yet some stories have escaped their attention. For example, the image to the top right is of Edward Teach. You probably know him as Blackbeard. 
He may be the most well-known of pirates of the Caribbean, along with his ship, Queen Anne's Revenge. Despite the attention pirates have received, so few authors have given only a passing glance to their connections to turtles and turtle consumption in the Caribbean. Here's one example. So the story goes that Blackbeard was coming from the Honduran coast toward Grand Cayman Island. And when he arrived, he met a turtle hunter on a small vessel, which he soon um, captured and confiscated his sloop. But he also took all of the turtle the hunter had captured. Like corsairs and buccaneers, Blackbeard would come to enjoy turtle, turtle soup, and rely on it as an important victual. One of the arguments that I make in my book is that the minuscule size of these islands and many others may offer us a fuller portrait of the Caribbean past. Most importantly, I argue that the historical role of sea turtles and the human populations that hunted and consumed them in the Caribbean played a fundamental role in the development of the edges, both figurative and physical, of the region. For example, the exploration and the peopling of the New World was dependent on sea turtles. Early European explorers fed on the fatty flesh of these marine reptiles to diversify the ship's provisions and to drive back malnourishment and disease all too common on their voyages, sojourning across the Atlantic Ocean and Caribbean Sea. As travel accounts circulated of their New World voyages, other explorers also sought out sea turtles to stock up their warehouses. Live sea turtles kept for weeks on the decks of ships without need of food, though a little water wouldn't hurt them. And as one scientist explained, turtles were big, abundant, available, savory, sustaining, and remarkably tenacious of life. This led explorers and new arrivals to settle in corners of the region like the Bahamas, the Bay Islands of Honduras, or the Caymans, which were neither rich in minerals nor soil, but abundant in sea turtles and other marine resources. Moreover, maritime activities like turtle fishing have been silenced in Caribbean history. The rest of my talk will explain how the turtle men who hunted, sold, and consumed sea turtles for a living came to be a part of this region's maritime past. In my talk, I'm gonna first elaborate on this idea about understanding the Caribbean, not from the vantage point of the plantation, but the sea. The Caribbean um, became a vibrant maritime space and turtling or turtle hunting was one aspect of it. Then I want to explain how sea turtles became a part of the diet for people living in and passing through the Caribbean and how it led to the evolution of various turtle hunting techniques. Next, I wanna discuss how Caymanians came to be at the forefront of a turtle trade that will link them closely to Key West by the 20th century. And finally, I discuss how this trade came into decline due to overfishing and the rise of international efforts to conserve sea turtle populations. Before we move too far into my talk, it's important that I situate you within the Caribbean. This is one of a few maps I will show today. And although less colorful, this map better shows the turtle fishing communities in the Caribbean. For the people I studied in my book, many of them spent most of their lives on water or isolated sandbars, keys, and remote islands. The sea framed their worldviews, shaped trading networks, and geographical mental maps. As a result, I called this space the Maritime Caribbean and linked turtlemen to an array of places like Georgetown Cayman Islands, Kingston, Jamaica, Key West, Florida, to perhaps more unfamiliar places in the region, the Mosquito Keys of Nicaragua, Turtle Bogue of Costa Rica, San Andres and Providencia Islands of Colombia. My book's story plays out in these regional nooks which were the center and not the periphery of the turtle men's world. For our purposes today, 
I just want you to zero in on those three red circles on this map. At the top, um, circle one is the location of Key West. And perhaps for many of my listeners, um, they may be located there right now. Circle three is the location of the island of Grand Cayman, the largest of the three inhabited um, Caymanian islands. Finally, circle five represents the Mosquito Keys, the most important turtle fishing grounds right off the coast of Nicaragua and Honduras. During the course of my talk, I will reference these places and explain how they are linked through the turtle trade. And perhaps for those of you who are unfamiliar with Central America, um, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time referring to the Mesquite Keys. Sea turtles have played a significant role in the development of prehistoric human societies. From the Indian to Atlantic oceans, archeological remains reveal the use of deposited turtle bones in funeral rites, domestic tools, and decorative items, both for elite and non-elite members. Despite the lack of written records, maritime archeologists and marine biologists argue that we can learn a lot about the cultural milieu of these ancient societies from the material remains. According to historical ecologists, pre-Columbian populations enjoyed and lived around 90 or so million green and hawksbill turtles spread across nine nesting sites with the bulk of them located in the Western Caribbean, places such as the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, the Cayman Islands, the Mosquito Keys um, outside of Nicaragua and Honduras, Turtle Bogue of Costa Rica, and the Archipelago of Bocas del Toro of Panama. In the images to the left, you can see examples of the pre-Columbian use of turtles in their arts, whether it's the image at the top that shows um, a pottery from the Taino um, indigenous populations of the Caribbean, of this um, dish um, reflected in the shape of a turtle, um, or the middle and bottom pictures showing the temple of the turtles at Uxmal in the Yucatan Peninsula. This is where the ancient Mayan civilization had its um, temple, which was also the site of a large turtle nesting ground. Many prehistoric um, populations um, in Central America and throughout the Caribbean considered the turtle as central to creation stories because of their longevity. Thus, we should not be surprised to find early European explorers also taking an interest in these marine reptiles too, particularly in their arrival in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. It would be an understatement to say that sea turtles once reigned over the Caribbean Sea and were seen just about everywhere. Early modern European explorers noted the sightings of turtles regularly in their writings. For example, Christopher Columbus and his crew frequently chronicled the astonishing number of turtles in the region. During his second voyage in 1494, priest and chronicler Andres Bernaldez noted how Columbus and his crew encountered a multitude of sea turtles around some Cuban offshore islands. He described the amount of turtles on and around the islands as follows. The sea was all thick with them and they were of the very largest, so numerous that it seemed as though the ships would run aground on them and were as if they were bathing in them. By his fourth voyage in 1503, Columbus's son Ferdinand described a similar scene. As the crew approached a shoreline, they saw swarms of turtles on land and sea, making the islands from afar appear to them like little rocks. The Italian explorer named the pair of islands Las Tortugas, or the turtles, though this name would lose favor to the Caymans in the future. Columbus was not the only early explorer to give a place the name turtles. This happened frequently. In fact, tales of Columbus's voyages and encounters with the flora and fauna helped other European explorers 
who learned to appreciate marine reptiles as an essential provision along dangerous and lengthy transatlantic voyages. Juan Ponce de Leon, the veteran Spanish conqueror and former crewmate of Christopher Columbus, learned such a lesson. After his skirmishes with local indigenous populations and identifying the future location of the Spanish settlement at St. Augustine, De Leon and his three vessel fleet sailed along the Floridian Peninsula toward the Caribbean Sea. Upon reaching the southwest corner of the peninsula, the Spanish conqueror and his crew ran across a group of scattered islands. Seeking to replenish provisions, De Leon and his crew came ashore, capturing 170 green turtles in a single evening in 1513. The astonishing number of sea turtles nesting along the beach evoked De Leon to name the islands Las Tortugas, or the turtles. These islands, however, should not be confused with Las Tortugas, which Christopher Columbus had found 10 years earlier. Today, we know them better by the name Dry Tortugas, and the abundance of sea turtles remained a site of interest for future visitors, including the naturalist John James Audubon. And for those of us uh, attending this event today and have not seen the Dry Tortugas National Park um, within the Florida Keys, I've presented a, an image um, to the top to give you a, a kind of an aerial view of this space um, today anyway. Observing their trek from the sea to the beach, um, Audubon, who visited Dry Tortugas um, in the 1800, wrote the following. Slowly advancing landward, their heads alone above the water, are observed heavy laden turtles, anxious to deposit their eggs in the well-known sands. On the surface of the gently rippling stream, I dimly see their broad forms as they toil along, while at intervals may be heard their hurried breathings, indicative of suspicion and fear. The turtle having landed, slowly and laboriously drags her heavy body over the sand. How industriously she removes the sand beneath her, casting it out on either side. Layer after layer, she deposits her eggs, arranging them in the most careful manner, and with her hind paddles, brings the sand over them. The business is complete. With a joyful heart, the turtle swiftly retires towards the shore and launches into the deep. Audubon had managed to view and then beautifully describe an activity quite common for turtles. And he will not be the only one who will find have had this experience. You may be wondering what sort of turtle can be found or turtles can be found in the Caribbean and why were they pursued? Well, there are six species which are found in the Caribbean the loggerhead, the green, the leatherneck, the hawksbill, the olive ridley, and the kemp's ridley. With the exception of the two ridley species, which nest largely in the Guianas uh, and the Yucatan Peninsula, the nesting sites of turtle species are widely dispersed across the Caribbean. Given these contemporary preferred locations, Few early modern accounts even mention the olive or the Kemp, Kemp's Ridley. English buccaneer and naturalist William Dampier offered an extensive description of sea turtles in his book titled A New Voyage Round the World. In this 17th century account, he chronicled how turtles resided mostly along the channels thick with seagrass and identified four principal sea turtle species. He notes, he noted the trunk, now called the leatherneck, the loggerhead, the hawksbill, and the green. Unlike loggerheads and leathernecks, hawksbill and green turtles became widely consumed for a variety of purposes and later transformed into global commodities that linked the Caribbean to the wider world. But the hawksbill and the green turtles were desired for different reasons. The hawksbill gained its name for its bird-like beak, and with the exception of a few Caribbean communities, 
most people did not consume it for animal protein. Due to its consumption of sponges, hawksbills has a high level of toxicity. However, many Caribbean communities ate hawksbill eggs and continue to do so today. That being said, it was arguably the most marketable of all sea turtles. Desired for their translucent marbled scutes with streaks of reddish black, golden yellow, brown and black across the oval shape backs or carapaces, this unusual palette of 13 colorful scales separates it from other turtle species. Due to their keratinous nature, scutes were durable and pliable. These characteristics combined with the colors long attracted human predators. For reasons not entirely clear, the carapace was wrongly called tortoise shell and artisans transformed the colorful pliable material into furniture, jewelry, and other decorative items for thousands of years, up until the beginning of the 20th century where plastics replaced it. And it's difficult for you to see me today, perhaps in this virtual format, um, I too enjoy the beautiful um, um, style of a tortoise shell. And while mine may not be real, the plastic um, uh, is trying to replicate the same um, luxurious colors um, that were quite um, common among the elite um, in the early modern and late 19th and early 20th centuries. The green turtle, however, is the most known of all the turtles in the Caribbean. Unlike the hawksbill, adult green Caribbean turtles forage exclusively on sea grass beds and underwater mangroves. This vegetarian diet is an unusual feature among turtle species and particular to the Caribbean variety. And just like the hawksbill's diet made it unfit for most human consumption, the green turtle's diet made it a high demand food. The meat of the green turtle um, was the most desired of all turtle species. With an exclusively vegetarian diet in its adulthood, green turtle meat and the gelatinous light yellow cartilage over the lower shell called calipi became a delicious addition to the plate of any diner. The color of its fat gave the green turtle its name and the green turtle soup became a popular dish for the wealthy and non-wealthy alike, particularly in Britain, um, and British colonies in the Caribbean, including, I would say, the former colony of the United States. Here to give you an example of how um, green um, turtle and turtle soup in particular was discussed, let me share a couple of anecdotes from um, the Caribbean. 18th century Scottish traveler, Janet Shaw, um, boasted about dining on fresh turtle while visiting a plantation in Antigua. She wrote, you get nothing but old ones in England. Here, they are young, tender, and fresh from the water where they feed as delicately and are as, and are as great epicures as they are on those that feed on them. Caribbean slaveholders also fed turtle meat to the enslaved populations. During a visit to Montego Bay, Lady Mariah Nugent attended a Christmas celebration with the city's local magistrate. Joined by whites and enslaved peoples, Nugent recounted how the crowd dined on turtle soup, pepper pot, calipash, and calipi, the gelatinous cartilage of the green turtle. While this might have been an example of a celebratory dish extended to enslaved people for Christmas, it's important to note the widespread consumption of turtle meat across the Caribbean eventually made its way to markets in Great Britain and throughout Europe. Ship captains welcomed the bountiful amounts of meat from live turtles sitting on the vessel's decks as they crossed the Atlantic Ocean and their tales of the voyages clearly raised interest among cosmopolitan elite. During the 18th century, British traders shipped live green turtles from West Indian ports to markets across the um, British Atlantic. London, Philadelphia, New York. Upon arrival, purchasers dressed, as they called it, turtles, and then served them in private homes, gentlemen's clubs, and upscale restaurants. It was a dish even desired by U.S. presidents. John Adams, the second president of the United States, reportedly dined on turtle soup 
on July 4th, 1776, the day our nation declared its independence from Britain. And it remained a popular dish among later US presidents, with it being a favorite dish of President William Taft. But hawksbill and green turtles were and are easy prey and their desirability reflects the ease with which human predators learn to capture and consume them. Although the pre-Columbian societies in the Caribbean had long hunted and harvested sea turtles, newcomers to the region in the colonial period soon followed suit. This led to an evolution in how hunters adapted to the availability and then growing scarcity of these marine reptiles. Initially, the easiest way to capture sea turtles were shore captures. As you can see with the image to the right, hunters often waited for sea turtles, especially impregnated turtles to come on shore to dig holes into the sand and deposit their eggs into chambers in much the same fashion as John James Ottoman described at dry tortugas. At their most vulnerable, predators, human and non-human, pounced on these giant animals with human hunters often turning them over onto their backs to minimize their mobility and secure easy capture. Yet sea turtles did not turn up on all beaches across the Caribbean, or at least all of the time. So if you wanted to obtain turtle, then you would have to hunt them at sea. To the right is a 19th century depiction of the famous mosquito turtleman. Likely not a very um, accurate depiction, depiction of, of this population. But that being said, um, the mosquito um, lived along the coast of present day Nicaragua and Honduras and, and, and their descendants continue to do so. European explorers and pirates of the Caribbean famously touted their skill at using harpoons to capture sea turtles. Dutch buccaneer Alexandre Exquemelin noted, the Indians often go to sea with the rovers or buccaneers, and many spend three or four years away without visiting their homeland. So among them are men who can speak very good English and French, just as there are many buccaneers who speak the in Indian language well. These Indians are a great asset to the rovers, as they are very good harpoonists, extremely skillful in spearing turtle. In fact, an Indian is capable of giving a whole ship's company of 100 men supplied with food. While striking or harpooning sea turtles became a distinctive feature of the mosquito, and to a lesser degree, Central America with pockets of turtle hunters um, found in places like the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, also striking for turtles, turtle hunting continued to evolve and innovate. By 1800, Caymanians had depleted local and nearby sources of turtles, which forced them to travel long distances in search of their prey. Long distance turtle hunts required changes to be made in the vessels that carried turtle men out to sea for weeks and months at a time. Any successful turtling expedition depended on a seaworthy vessel. Caymanian turtle men preferred schooners and sometimes sloops as their ideal watercrafts. Schooners were sailing vessels with fore and aft sails and two or more masts, while sloops had one mast with square sails. Most turtlers traveled with a 40 or 50 ton schooner or a sloop of equivalent size. Schooners and sloops were expensive in spite of Caymanian shipmakers reliance on local hardwoods. It could take between eight to 10 months for just one vessel to be completed, sometimes years if funds and time were scarce. Since costs were too steep for the average turtleman, most never owned schooners or sloops. Schooners were often owned by local merchants who used their capital to finance turtle voyages. But merchants who owned the schooners sought to maximize profits and they increased the capacity of schooners thereafter. Let's give an example. In 1905, there were four new vessels built with an aggregate tonnage of 126 um, tons with the single largest schooner at 51 tons. A year later in 1906, 
eight vessels were built with an aggregate tonnage of 728 tons, including the largest ever constructed turtling schooner called Clara Scott at 260 tons. The growth in tonnage suggests a few changes were underway in the turtle industry. With formerly robust turtle, um, turtle nesting grounds depleted, turtle hunters were driven farther out in the deep sea to fish over an extended period in order to attain a high catch. Transformations in the turtle fleet in terms of the size of the schooners also led changes with other components of the enterprise. Each turtling vessel, whether schooner or sloop, carried eight to 10 small canoes from which turtlemen set out to draw their nest, um, nets in the deep sea or leap out to grab turtles around the banks and the keys and the reefs. Drawn from inspiration from indigenous watercrafts of the greater Caribbean, Caymanians invariably used several Central American boats, including the pit pan or dugout, as well as the dory. Larger than the deep water um, worthy dory, the pit pan was smaller and faster canoe with a flat bottom. It traversed the sea not by paddle, but by sail or row. And I did my best to find a, a, a visual image um, of this watercraft and, and a modern version of it is what you see to the top left corner of the screen. In 1841, a British traveler named John Lloyd Stevens um, rode on a Belizean pit pan, which was about 40 feet long and six feet wide in the center, running to a point at both sides and made out of the trunk of a mahogany tree. He insisted the following, European ingenuity has not contrived of a better vessel to travel, to, uh, travel in the tributaries leading to the Caribbean Sea. It had been frequently used by mosquito harpooners of sea turtles. By the 20th century, Caymanians recalled how turtlemen felled wood from places like the Mosquito Key to carve a boat out of one log or trunk of tree. However, the vessel did undergo modifications to the pit pan model. Maritime archeologist Roger Smith has illustrated how Caymanians invented something known as the cat boat, which I have a description or a visual of um, in the middle um, picture of the screen. In 1904, um, a shipwright by the name of Daniel Jervis um, is credited with building the first cat boat, which he named Terra, to accommodate hunters of the Hawksbill turtle trade, the preferred prey for those islanders who grew up on the smaller island of Cayman Brack. Brackers, as they were known, liked to traverse on canoes in shallow waters to stalk um, hawksbills, which they snatched out of the water. For generations, they had used the pit pan. Over time, um, Bracker turtlemen found that the pit pan at 22 feet in length, six feet in breadth, too long to easily maneuver the vessel in pursuit of this marine reptile. Jervis's modification of the pit pan led to a shorter and a wider vessel at 14 feet in length and three feet, eight inches in breadth with oars and painted in a sea blue to camouflage itself within the water. The Terra became a prototype for the cat boat, which became popular with turtlemen, not just in the Cayman Islands, but beyond. If you ever have an opportunity to visit um, the Cayman Islands National Museum in Georgetown, they have a, a beautiful kind of a replica of the cat boat with even a kind of a, a, a model, a mannequin or a model in the uh, boat to kind of depict um, what the turtlemen look like in the boat. Um, so it's a really nice um, job. Unlike our mosquito strikers, Caymanian um, hunters relied on nets to catch sea turtles. It was not uncommon for a vessel to carry between 40 or 50 nets, though it was routine to find 30 nets on a turtling vessel. Nets were typically made from cotton or thatch rope. In fact, Caymanian women provided the thatch, a plated thin strip of silver palm thatch, which they use as a form of currency to barter for manufactured store goods and food staples, usually in between the arrival of their spouses and fathers from turtle hunting expeditions. 
By the early 20th century, the innovative work of Caymanian turtlemen increasingly captured the attention of outsiders. American photojournalist David Douglas Duncan, later known for his impressive coverage of combat in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, learned this for himself after he managed to snag an invitation to come aboard a Caymanian turtle schooner. In 1939, a sunburnt heavyset pipe smoker conversed casually with Duncan about the size of live green turtles corralled at the Thompson Enterprise dock in Key West. Amazed to see such large creatures, Duncan called the turtles big fellows. Yet these green turtles were still young, the man explained. He went on to say, in the deep sea turtle trade, we call those youngins chickens. Don't get to be turtles until they weigh over 125 pounds. Why, they're just babies. The knowledgeable man was Captain Alio Ebanks, a veteran turtleman and a captain of a turtling schooner. Captain Alley, as he was called, sensed a deeper interest from Duncan in the turtle trade and gave him an impromptu tour of the schooner. Afterwards, the turtleman casually extended an invitation to the man to join the crew on their turtle hunt in Nicaraguan waters. The sea captain warned, however, that it would be a difficult voyage. Well, we'll be sailing into dangerous waters. The sea will try to spit us out and the wind will hurl us back. The food's the same seven days a week and we won't be back for two months. Despite his honest assessment of the voyage, Duncan eagerly accepted this invitation to experience the lives of turtlemen. David Douglas Duncan documented the experience in a 1943 article titled, Capturing Giant Turtles in the Caribbean for the National Geographic magazine. The article featured Master Alio Ebanks and his nine member crew on the motorized 120 ton schooner, A. Matlin Adams, which was hunting green turtles in the offshore bars and keys alongside Nicaragua and the Caribbean Sea. Although Caymanian shipwrights built the Adams at their Grand Cayman shipyard, Thompson Enterprise in Key West commissioned and named it after the company's founding partner, Arius Matlin Adams. The owner, Norbert Thompson, hired Captain Alley to capture and carry as many live green turtles from Nicaragua to Thompson Enterprise docks in Key West. Through words and photographs, Duncan swept readers into the unfamiliar world of turtling. He recounted the daring 400 mile sojourn from Key West toward Cuba, southward to the headquarters of the turtling grounds at the Mosquito Keys, which lie 30 miles northwest of the maritime boundary between Honduras and Nicaragua in the Caribbean Sea. Among the Mosquito Keys lies a tiny palm crested island, scarcely more than a mangrove swamp known as the Mosquito Key, singular, where six schooners of the Caymanian turtle fleet base their turtle hunting operations. When the Adams moored there, Duncan recalled how turtlemen from other vessels came aboard to help them refill water tanks and exchange news from home in the United States, as well as update them on turtling conditions. Turtlemen relied on equipment to trap their prey traveling as far as 40 to 50 miles from um, the base of operation, captains prepared their crew to set the nets. It was the duty of the captain and his two mates to spot submerged rocks or coral um, heads lying 40 feet below the surface, but visible to the men on the cross arm raised about 50 feet high. When that was accomplished, the captain called fire away. Thenceforth, the crew heaved a 30 pound stone to serve as a weight with an attached 60 foot line. Then the other crew placed floating cork wood to serve as markers for the submerged rock while the schooner sought shelter by the reef. Each evening, three crew members set out on a cat boat to draw in the nets in search of their prey. Knowing sea turtles could not breathe underwater like fish, turtlemen waited for them to rise to the surface for air and thus become ensnarled in the nets. Knowledge of the turtle habits, however, did not guarantee a plentiful hunt. Duncan noted, of the 30 nets set by each boat, a catch of five turtles per dugout was considered good luck. A number of dangers often impaired a hunt. This included fleeing turtles, shark attacks, 
and powerful currents towing away a catch. Whatever the turtle men captured eventually got brought aboard the schooner where Captain Alley carved the initials of the vessel into the carapace of the turtles. The markings ensured that each schooner was properly credited for their catch at market in Key West. Afterwards, captured turtles were turned on their back and drenched with water until being kept in crawls or water pens enclosed with bamboo poles sunk in about five feet of water until departure for Florida or sent directly to Florida. After observing Captain Alley and the other turtlemen, Duncan viewed the turtle trade as a fascinating modern romance of the sea. He portrayed it as almost timeless in its continuity, writing, from grandfather to father to son, only the men and the vessels change. After 150 years, the method of fishing remains much the same and turtles seemingly are just as numerous. And yet, were Duncan's impressions correct? Had little change for turtle hunters in the turtle trade other than the participating people and vessels? Despite the photojournalist's romanticized depiction of turtlemen's brave equanimity in the face of tremendous challenges, a great deal had changed. Markets for Caymanian source green turtle shifted from England to the United States after 1900. More ship owners had secured advanced contracts from buyers in the United States and often delivered the green turtles directly to American ports, such as Key West. In doing so, they kept more of their profits as fewer turtles died during the voyage. A Jamaican governor explained the process. It is custom now to sell turtle on the fishing ground from whence they are taken, principally to Key West, USA, by boats run by the purchaser. Whether it was a better deal for most turtlemen, it hurt local revenue as fewer turtles were brought back to the Cayman Islands. But why did the shift move toward the U.S. and more specifically Key West? Well, it's true that by 1900, American purchasers increasingly absorbed the largest share of Caymanian hunted green turtle. And within a few years, it dominated the market. Affluent diners had long consumed turtle soup and turtle steak at high-end fashionable restaurants or men's clubs. In the annual report of the colony, the Jamaican governor stated that in 1913 um, passed with no scarcity of buyers of turtle. But during the interwar years, soup manufacturers sold canned turtle products to a wider American market. Key West was the principal market for Caymanian caught green turtle, since turtle men earned two fifths of the price it realized they realized a week or 10 days later in New York and other northern cities of America. Yet consumers in northeastern cities enjoyed turtle food and turtle products too. In 1938, Life magazine published a story about Moore and Company, the largest turtle cannery in the United States. The cannery reportedly received bi-weekly delivery of Caribbean green turtles, of which only 30% of their meat was used. While few Caymanian turtlemen recalled New York as a market for their turtles, the majority of them remembered Thompson Enterprises and its turtle cannery in Key West. Key West locals and historians probably already know this story, but I'll share it to those unfamiliar with it. Thompson Enterprises was a leading Key West company involved in seafood processing as well as several other industries. Its founder, John N. Norberg, a Swedish immigrant settled in the area sometime after the United States annexed Florida in 1821. By the 1840s, Norberg had become a U.S. citizen, adopted the surname Thompson, and found tremendous success as a dry goods merchant. By the turn of the 20th century, his grandsons, Norberg and Carl Thompson, appeared to be enjoying unparalleled success in Key West, with Thompson Enterprises owning nearly all the businesses along the Key West Bight. Thompson Enterprises had various holdings, which included trucking, hardware stores, ice making, sponge fishing, and cigar box making. In 1910, Norberg Thompson added a Grand, a grand Day Turtle um, Cannery to the fam family business. During the 1930s, 
Thompson Enterprises was the country's largest employer at Key West, followed by the Workers' Progress Administration in the United States Navy. Thompson Enterprises managed to secure a regular supply of fresh green turtles by establishing contracts with Grand Caymanians. Through local agents, Thompson arranged with the ship captain of his vessel a predetermined sum for every captured adult turtle weighing 120 pounds or more, which was to be delivered to his dock in Key West. Captain Ali Ebanks and later David Chesley Parsons served as masters to his schooner, Adams, taking crew down to the familiar hunting grounds around the offshore banks and keys of Nicaragua, Honduras, and Costa Rica. Since, Tom, since Thompson had a crawl outside his Key West bite, Caymanian turtlemen no longer needed to return to their home port to store the animals in preparation for market. A former employee remembered how Thompson hired day laborers to assist in hauling the sea turtles from the Adams and down into the five water pens, which you can see an example of in the top right corner of the PowerPoint screen. Writing, we had two men that would cut the spancel, one, one of the workers recalled, put a rope around their flipper and lower them down the pen so they didn't hit the other turtles and damage them. It really was just like falling down the chutes. Given the capacity to hold several thousand green turtles, some remained as long as a year before they headed to the cannery. Thompson also filled orders and sent green turtles to Heinz and Moore and Company, which bought an entire year's supply at one time. An unknown, no, an unknown number of green turtles simply escaped from the pens and avoided their tragic fate. Upon successful delivery, Thompson paid the captain who then settled the voyage with their accompanying crew. And so the trade with Key West continued in this manner until the 1960s when it became clear that the turtle trade was changing again. For eight weeks in late 1963, Wright Langley, a Northern photographer, likely documented Captain Ali Ebanks' last turtle hunt. Always an affable host, Captain Alley permitted the photography student to accompany him and his crew on the schooner Adams to take photos of Caymanian seamen at work. Captain Alley was no stranger to outside interest in the turtle fishery. 20 years earlier, he had invited the National Geographic freelance photojournalist to come along on a similar voyage. As with David Douglas Duncan, Captain Alley carried Langley on the well-traveled circuit from Key West Dockyard to the port at Georgetown and onward to the Nicaraguan turtle hunting grounds. But much had changed in the intervening 20 years. The West Bay Sea Captain frequently had difficulty staffing his crew with skilled, hardworking, and reliable men. In, recent year, in those recent years, Captain Alley hired more independent turtlemen as rangers to support his undermanned aging crew of only three men. He lamented, most of my crew is getting along in years and they don't seem to be any young men on Grand Cayman interested in learning turtling. I think I'll quit the sea and retire. He was not alone. The other two remaining turtle schooners shared this predicament. Although 20 years younger, Captain Osbert Ebanks of the scooter Antares also spoke of retirement. This may well be my last trip to the Mosquito Key. I just can't round up a crew anymore. Captain Joe of the schooner Lydia Wilson also complained about um, crew scarcity, and yet his problem was more acute. The Wilson was the only schooner of the Turtle Fleet, which included just three um, ships, that had not transitioned from a sailing to an engine-powered vessel. I have to do all the repairs and most of the navigating, he explained. Moreover, the turtle schooner captains increasingly captured smaller numbers of turtles at the Mosquito Keys. Astute about conditions in the turtle fishery, Captain Alley warned Langley not to think too much about the 100 turtles that the turtlemen caught within two days. Don't let this give you the wrong impression. We'll have days when we have um, catched six or seven. Within a week's time, the Adams crew had captured only seven turtles among the three cat boats. Captain Alley planned to fish the banks off of Cape Gracias outside of Honduras and make up for the poor day's catch. 
Captain Osbert also had difficulty catching turtles. He considered it a sign to entirely give up turtling. Captain Alley, however, refused to assign this pattern to a more ominous meaning at that point, the overharvesting of green turtles. Sidestepping the issue of depletion of turtle stocks, he chalked it up to timing. We usually make our best catches before the mating season, January through April, but we come out all year round since not all the turtles leave Mosquito Keys for Costa Rica at once. Their infrequent hunts, however, were unlikely to, ble to, to deplete green turtle stocks in Nicaraguan waters as they had done around the Cayman Islands and the Cuba, they surmised. Captain Alley noted how Caymanian turtlemen don't come regularly. To him, it was likely due to a shift in this green turtle migration. You remember one day we didn't have such a good catch? Just a year ago when we fished there, we made a large catch. The turtles look for greener pastures and when they find them, they move their homes nearer to their food supply. In sum, Caymanian turtlemen simply needed to better follow and not save the turtles. Others would come to a different conclusion. Scientists like Archie Carr, seen in the upper right corner, would champion an international movement to conserve sea turtles in the Caribbean. Using local knowledge of Caymanian sea captains and Caribbean turtlemen, Carr designed and implemented a turtle tagging program in collaboration with local communities, foreign governments, and international scientists that all responded to his calls for drastic measures to save the turtles. By 1975, Carr's efforts had paid off. The Convention of the International Trade and Indentured Species of Wild Fauna and Flora placed the green and hawksbill turtle products on their endangered species list. Such legislation meant an end to a turtle trade that once tied Key West and the Cayman Islands together. While turtle fishing is remembered and promoted as part of Caymanian heritage, as seen in the stamp um, below, it is a bittersweet memory to the remaining men and women who came from families whose men spent generations hunting and consuming turtle in the wider Caribbean. And I will end here and, and open it up to any questions um, that you may have. And I see a couple of questions. Let's see if I can, um, okay. So one of the questions I, I see from Laura, um, which countries and states were the largest consumers of turtle food products? Um, it was actually quite um, wide and, and it would be in places where you typically saw um, Turtles, particularly um, turtles would come to nest in their eggs. So you would find them in places like um, the Caribbean um, coastlines of um, Costa Rica, Panama, um, Honduras. You would even see pockets of them on the Pacific coast of the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. Um, it was not uncommon for um, parts of Cuba, the Cayman Islands, um, all three of the places, um, Cayman Island, um, Grand Cayman, Cayman Brack, and Little Cayman, um, to have um, consumable turtle um, products. Um, it was quite common um, to hunt um, in, as part of the hawksbill trade and even to consume the meat and the eggs on the small islands um, owned by Colombia, San Andres, and Providencia. It's not uncommon to hear people talk about turtle um, meat dishes in Honduras. Um, so it's widely, and I'm not even talking about maybe what we think of as the Eastern Caribbean where they're not consuming so much green turtle meat or hawksbill eggs, but they also are consuming um, some of the other lesser marketable um, turtles. Um, you know, in places like the small islands and the lesser um, Antilles. So it's, it's actually widely um, consumable, including Mexico to both the Pacific and the Caribbean coast. There's some anthropologists working on that. So yeah, it was, it's actually quite common. I like to tell the story of um, being a, a graduate student doing research in Colombia, and I was fortunate enough to stay with a local, a local woman whose son lived in the United States in Houston, and she was preparing to visit her son. 
And in her home, she was cooking up this dish and his favorite dish was turtle meat. And I remember her offering it to me and I kept thinking, well, you know, no, thank you, but I, I appreciate the offer. But how is she going to get it on the plane? She cooks so much food. And so it's really a, a very common part of the diet um, for um, small kind of um, coastal and island um, communities of the Caribbean. Um, what certain species of turtle preferred and are and have different culinary qualities? Um, for the most part, you don't. Um, green turtle is the most commonly desired and, et, um, and eaten for the reasons that I I, I, I went over. Um, just because it's a it's more of a, it's a vegetarian diet, the meat is often described as lean like veal, and it's highly desirable. However, I would also point out that um, turtle eggs um, are highly desired as a food. Um, for some communities, they think it's like um, aphrodisiac. And so you might see people prepare turtle eggs and dishes. Um, and then you don't typically find um, the loggerhead or the leather neck, at least among the Caymanian and other turtling communities that I studied. Um, they didn't have any market value. In fact, there are incidences, there are accounts in which um, turtle men would be hunting, you know, they would draw their nets and they would be, you know, angry to find out that a loggerhead or a leather neck um, had been a part of their catch. And, and, and so they would tell stories like how, you know, sometimes they would be kind of volatile. They might kick them or, or be very angry um, because they had no market value. You couldn't really eat them um, or consume them and you couldn't sell them for anything. So um, it's not very um, marketable. Is there a current day market for turtle? Um, yes, and it's illegal, it's illicit. Um, I just read that there was um, an incident in Florida um, just about a week or two ago, um, but it wasn't green or hawksbill turtles. I think it was a, a type, like a more of a terrapin, more of a, a, a kind of Floridian type, I guess that's also um, being monitored and regulated. Um, in, in various countries, there are um, laws, like in Costa Rica, you can only um, consume enough that you can eat. Um, however, we're finding that there are um, ties between um, the turtle illicit trade and drug trafficking. So where, where you're finding smugglers coming in through maritime routes, they're not only um, smuggling in narcotics, they're also smuggling in um, turtle-derived um, products as well. Um, and there's been um, some renewed intention um, with the conservation efforts, particularly in places like Costa Rica. In the Cayman Islands, you can obtain a turtle burger if you want, um, in part because they have a um, farm, like a turtle farm, so it's not um, wild caught turtle. I mean, they're, they're producing in on this, this farm that there's been some allegations of animal care and abuse by, by some who are concerned um, about the treatment um, that these farm-raised turtles are, are, are experiencing. But it is um, available in that sort of limited legal space. So in most places, you can consume just enough to eat like a meal, but you cannot take more um, that would jeopardize um, the turtle populations. Um, and that also includes like tortoise shell, like earrings or decorative, you know, jewelry. Um, in most places, those things are deemed illegal. You're not able, you're not supposed to purchase it or hold it or sell it, um, though you may find um, places where it is being sold um, because people don't always abide by these types of um, regulations and, and laws limiting their behaviors to having access to something they've had access to for a very long time. Uh, Nancy tells us the early 70s, you could buy turtle steaks at grocery stores. Um, I would love if, if Nancy or someone could share, but it also tastes like veal. Um, I, I've not had um, turtle meat, but I'm sort of curious in Key West. Um, nope, loggerheads were not eaten. Um, I think I got over to the restrictions on turtle harvesting. Um, yes, James, you're correct. Cayman Islands has a turtle farm um, today. Um, it, it's sort of a place you, you can visit it. Um, you can. They have these um, large water, sort of water pens, and you can interact with the various um, turtles. Um, that being said, I know that there are um, US-based and I'm sure internationally based um, animal rights 
um, activists who have some concerns about um, the care and the treatment of turtles in these types of capacities. I've, I have visited um, the turtle farm at Grand Cayman with my children um, and, and they enjoyed it, but I did receive calls back. I remember coming back to the United States and, and someone looking me up on the internet and, and asking me a lot of questions about uh, my experiences um, at the farm and expressing a lot of concerns um, with regards to the treatment um, and care of the animals. Um, let's see, do any islands in the Caribbean today have preserved sections of historical turtle crawls and pens? Um, no, not that I, that's a great question. Um, so Ryan asked, you know, can I, did I see um, some of these turtle crawls and pens? I didn't see them, but I suspect that they do exist. Um, I do know that in, um, let me share the map again, because I think it might help to orient all of us. Um, see if I can go back to the map here. Uh, yeah. So you see the um, circle number five, that's around Mosquito Keys. If you go a little bit southwest of there, um, closer to San Andres and Providencia Islands, it's, it's basically a dispersed set of archipelagos. There's these little um, land masses in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. And I suspect that you may see remnants of these water pens. Um, remember, people still live in those communities. Um, there might be efforts internationally um, that have ended the trade like on an international scale, but people still will go to fish for lobster. They'll still go hunt a, you know, turtle. They'll still um, utilize the infrastructure that had been created for them. And I have seen on the internet, um, people particularly who sail, who've made these like um, sailing trips to the Caribbean and they visited these these more obscure um, places, um, images that suggest that perhaps you could find um, remnants of these water pens um, um, likely preserved. Not fully because, you know, there have been hurricanes and other natural disasters that probably um, have um, diminished their ability to, to stay in stay in effect. Um, have the turtle population, yes, this is a great question. Peter asks, has the turtle population stabilized to become sustainable? I don't think it's sustainable yet, but we have seen in um, both in the hawksbill population and the green turtles, um, we have seen um, a, a kind of a regrowing of that turtle population. So the efforts, the conservation efforts that we've seen led by, um, you know, people like Archie Carr and, and, and those he um, helped to train, um, particularly in places like Costa Rica, but in other places in the Caribbean. I just received an email from a biologist um, a couple of weeks ago who heard of my book and sent me his article about the hawks bill that we are seeing um, some positive growth, not enough to remove them from um, you know, being considered an endangered species, but you know, we, we do see some optimism um, that the efforts that are being laid out are, are the right ones in terms of protecting these species. Um, Barbados has a rich turtle history. Um, yep, I didn't, so um, I, I didn't look at Barbados um, because my area of, of area, area of specialty was the Western Caribbean. Um, so I didn't do a lot on the Eastern side of the Caribbean. Um, I wish I could speak more to Barbados. I didn't get a chance to research um, on the island of Barbados, um, but love to hear more if you send me an email, if you know of people who are writing about it. Um, you know, Cayman Islands became sort of the well-known case example because their entire economy was centered around turtles um, up until the 60s and 70s as it transitioned to tourism and then eventually um, being a, a financial um, center, um, a center of financial activity. And, and while you might see turtle fishing happening in many places, um, Barbados is still considered by and large a place where agro export economy is happening, where sugar was happening, um, eventually other tropical commodities and turtle um, fishing, when it does happen, it's ancillary. It's not the dominant um, economic activity. But if it were at some point, I'd love to read more about it. And, and please feel free to um, reach out to me and, and send me um, some information. I think I've, I think I addressed all the questions that I saw in um, the chat function. And uh, I know that it's a little after five, so I'm going to 
perhaps you know, turn it into turn it over to Cassandra and, and see where to go from there. All right, perfect. I just want to go ahead and thank everybody again for uh, joining us today. Don't forget to hit the donate button if you haven't already, and if you can. Um, and then our next happy hour, the historian, is going to be on February 10th. Um, again, that's free programming. Just go on to the website, register, and then our next DSS is going to be on February 18th. All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Sharika.